Hey folks, welcome to my talk about uh, techniques for SLOs and error budgets at scale. I'm proud to be presenting here at uh, Conf42 Observability in 2023. I've been talking a lot about SLOs and error budgets over the past six or so years. And over that time, I've given um, variations of this talk in different online conferences and also uh, a couple in person. So I'm pleased to be presenting the, some of my learnings over the past couple of years. This is basically the greatest hits version of the previous talks I've given on the subject. Let's get started. But first, I know this is an online conference, but uh, let's do a little survey. Raise your hand. I know you're sitting there just at home by yourself, but raise your hand if you know what this graph is. And this is one of those graphs that if you know, you know. We're all here today in part because of this thing. And if you don't know what this is, that's okay. We'll go ahead and uh, come back to that a little bit later. So, hi, I'm Fred. I'm a uh, observability engineer at a large public company. And um, this talk is my own opinions, not those of my employers, basic disclaimer. And so I've been um, working on monitoring observability for about as long as the graph on the previous slide, but focusing on it heavily over the past 10 or so years. Uh, I like to think about uh, SLOs, SLIs, and error budgets, hence the uh, slogician term. I think that was coined in the original Google SLO paper. Uh, I like to hack on you know, histograms, metrics, logs, and traces. Been programming a lot of stuff over the past 20 years, and uh, I've got uh, two young kids, so I definitely am in need of more sleep and coffee. But let's go ahead and kick this off. So how do you implement SLOs for a thousand plus engineers? And this was a challenge I encountered about four years ago when I started a role at a company called Zendesk. And I got tasked with a project to bring SLOs to an engineering organization that had over a thousand engineers, which was quite a few. And there was a big push to make the product as reliable as possible. We called reliability our, our number one feature. So I had to come up with a way to roll out SLOs and air budgets um, across all those engineers. And to do that effectively, I really had to understand what SLIs and SLOs and hence air budgets were programmatically. So I really dove in and started to research the subject a lot to kind of go back to the basics. And speaking of basics, I started off by reading the original Google SRE book, followed that up with the uh, SRE workbook, watched uh, Liz Fong Jones and Seth Fargo's Google Cloud presentation on SLOs titled SLIs, SLOs, SLIs, oh my, which was an inspiration to me. And I'd given a number of SLO talks previously, most notably one called Latency SLOs Done Right, which was also given at SRECon um, by Theo Schlossnagel and Heinrich Hartmann, who've written a lot on the subject. And even looking back at that talk I gave, I can spot the errors in it, which were kind of subtle. But what I found researching this topic here is there wasn't really a prescription for SLIs and SLOs. The Google books talked a lot about SLIs, but were vague on the subject as far as specific examples were concerned. And even working through some of the examples in the SRE workbook, you know, I either found you know subtle omissions or or places where the examples weren't you know completely uh, flushed out and tested. Liz and Seth's Google Cloud video had some concise definitions, so I took those as a base and expanded on them. And those are in use by you know some of the major SLO vendors out there now. And over the next few years, there was kind of what I call a Cambrian SLO explosion. Get it? SLO explosion. Little dad joke there. Um, but there was this explosion in SLO material um, with SLO specific conferences and also Alex Hidalgo's book on implementing SLOs. So I got to work creating formulas that can be shared across a large organization, which would leave little room for creativity and variance because I wanted everyone on the same page. I wanted to be able to give prescriptive formulas that could be implemented at broad scale. So this is what I came up with. The definition of an SLI is what I used to put examples together. Now there's two major SLI opinionations, though the difference between them is a bit subtle at first glance. The first is from the Google SRE book, which describes an SLE, SLI pardon me, as a measurement of system performance. Um, the second, which you know I found first in uh, Liz and Seth's video, describes an SLI as something that delineates good requests from bad requests. And that second opinion is really one that resonated well with me. So in effect, you know, both opinionations did service at Google, um, even though you know they're somewhat conflicting. 
But the second, as I mentioned, is implemented more broadly by uh, practitioners and vendors that I found. And I decided to base my example on that second opinionation, um, not only because it had wider acceptance, because intuitively it made more sense to me. And I spent a, quite a bit of time dissecting those examples in the Google SRE book and the SRE workbook. And, I, you know, they were good, but I mean, I think the evolution of uh, SLIs and SLOs at Google probably bifurcated, you know, because they have a lot of teams there. Um, and that's not a criticism of the book or the organization, um, but the definitions that I came across seem to be more abstract than what I was looking for. And so here are three examples of SLIs for the second op SLI opinion that I'm, opinionation that I moved forward with. They each consist of three things, a metric identifier, a metric operator, and a metric value. This approach is one that is straightforward for a human being to understand, but also fits easily into most of the you know, open source and commercial monitoring and observability software out there. The part of the SLI definition which requires the most consideration is what that metric value should be, and that's one that is often tuned or calibrated by an engineering team, you know, either for latency most often, you know, and sometimes uh, with error response codes like a 5XX, that's pretty clear that that's a bad request, um, but it's gonna be up to engineering teams to determine like, you know, is a 404 a bad request? Or is that um, just clients thinking that they're going to the right place? Because really all of this stuff is about um, feeling customer pain and wanting to make sure that they have a great experience. And so, you know, this, I kind of cemented this uh, examples that I could uh, socialize widely within the engineering org of what an SLI was, which leads to what's an SLO. And that definition, you know, came down to the number of good requests divided by the number of bad requests over a time range. And this is often called a, you know, a request-based SLO where you count up the number of requests and see you know, if you got 99% of them right over a certain time range. And you know, I call the, um, the three different components here are a little bit different. Uh, in the red, we have the success objective, which you know, is your typical how many nines. And then we drop the SLI in, which works really well for a lot of the you know, tooling out there. And then we have a period. And if you don't have a time period here, you don't really have an SLO because it's, it's really important to specify this so that you're evaluating it over something that's meaningful to the customer. And one question that has come up is, how do I know how many nines to choose for this success objective? Um, when I was at Zenesk, we had an engineering VP named Jason Smale, who was, you know, very technical and engineers, you know, had him highly regarded. And so he said, we need to hit three and a half nines. And so that 99.95% number became known as Smale's number. And if reliability dipped below that number, it usually meant that a customer somewhere was feeling pain. And this is really, you know, if you want to get into enterprise software, this is kind of, you must you know, meet this criteria, you know, to get on the ride. And so, you know, now that you realize you're dealing with enterprise customers and you need three and a half nines, how do you pick an appropriate metric value for your SLI since that's the only dependent variable now that you fix the objective at 99.95? Uh, and this is essentially what I call calibrating your SLO. Take a time period of known good performance, set your objective at 99.95 and iterate across your SLI to figure out what latency value gives you that 99.95%. You know, in this example, it could be 100 milliseconds. And I was able to develop some simple tooling to do that um, or use our commercial monitoring tooling to do that and developed a dashboard where engineers could, you know, set their ex objective at 99 and a half and then iterate over their latency to see, you know, kind of what their, you know, what latency value was it that the customers were getting these three and a half nines performance. And you know, just to reiterate, you know, the time period here is very important, and this is a common oversight that I've seen in most of the literature. They'll say, take an SLO of 100 milliseconds at 99.9%, but what time period is that over? Is it over a minute, an hour, a week? Um, and you can and you probably should have SLOs which use the same success objective in SLI, but different time periods depending on the stakeholder. An engineering manager might want uh, to know the reliability over a week so they can schedule reliability work. A director might want to know it over a month. And a VP might want to know how reliable the service was over a quarter for reporting to C staff or setting the direction of technical efforts.
And the purpose of, reliab purpose of SLOs is often to prioritize reliability work. That is, if you aren't meeting your SLOs, you want to deprioritize feature work in favor of reliability engineering. And we want to do this, and we want, we want to use these equations to do this because we want to be accurate. If we reprioritize engineering resources, that is expensive. So we want to make sure that we're doing that based off data that's correct and precise. Now let's take a quick look at error budgets. So an error budget is essentially just an inverted SLO. You subtract your success objective from one and you get your allowed failure rate for user requests. Like a financial budget, you have a certain amount of errors that you can spend over a time period. And ideally, this is an amount that does not make your customers think that your service is unreliable. You can create monitors for this with most of the tooling out there and perhaps alert when say 80% of your error budget has been used up for a given time period, which you know will let your engineering teams know that it's time to work on reliability. You can also alert when the rate of an error budget uh, burn predicts that you will exhaust your error budget before the time period has elapsed. And tooling, you know, a lot of the tooling out there has you know, functionality for that. So there are really two conditions that your error budget should spur action. First, if it's being used up too quickly and is in danger of being exhausted for that period, that should prioritize reliability focused work. The second is if your error budget is not being used up at all. That could indicate you know, an improperly calibrated SLO, or it might mean that your service is normally so reliable that you're not prioritizing enough feature work or that you should embark on controlled error budget burns. Google did that uh, and mentioned it in the SRE book with their Chubby service, which was a distributed lock service. They introduced artificial error budget burn into their consumption um, into the service so that uh, consumers of Chubby you know, would have to you know, make their services be able to tolerate those Chubby failures and hence become more reliable. And again, like SLOs, error budgets should reflect the mindset of the customer as much as possible. If the error budget is not exhausted, but your customer is on the phone with your VP, go take a look at what you're measuring and if it really reflects what the customer is experiencing. So to sum up what I've showed you so far, there's a few points on getting thousands of engineers on the same page for SLOs and error budgets. First, you need real world examples. Most of the published books out there are a bit you know, abstract and hand wavy and don't really give you complete examples. So you need to have those to show folks. Second, present formulas for each of those entities, which can be read easily both by humans and machines. And I've, I've shown you what I used at scale there. Third, you have to be detailed and consistent. I see so many SLOs out there that leave off the time period. You might say, well, the time range can be whatever you want, but then it's not an action SLO an actual or actionable SLO or air budget without a time range. So we've looked at some example SLOs that most engineers can parse and memorize and which engineering managers and product managers can use to correlate user happiness with. In most cases, that happiness means your service is available and it's running fast. We can take the formulas I just showed and extend them to cover both conditions at once. So here we're talking about not only availability, but also latency and both of those, you know, you need to have both of those. So here's an example, SLI, SLO and error budget, which covers both latency and availability. So if the page response is not a 5XX or a request was served in under 100 milliseconds, that request can be considered to be a good request. That's our SLI to which we can add a success objective of three and a half nines and a time range of seven days to be evaluated on. To get the error budget, we can subtract a success objective of 99.95% from one, which gives us an error budget of 0.05%. It's easy to understand and you can also easily create multiple SLOs and error budgets from the base SLI just by extending the time range. Now, on the point of the success objective here, I have you know 99.95% listed, it's three and a half nines. Realistically, this is what enterprise customers demand these days. That means out of a million requests, you only get 500 requests that are slow or, you know, or return you know, what we also know as a fail whale or you know, the 500 internal server error as an example. And so if you're at scale, this should be your success objective. And I go into this uh, in depth a little bit in the presentation shown below on the link for my SRECon presentation. So at this point, 
We've got uh, example formulas for SLIs, SLOs, and air budgets that should be easy for folks to understand and also straightforward to implement with most monitoring and observability tooling out there, both open source and commercial. Of the two components of latency and availability, availability is generally pretty easy to measure. The most you know, simple example is a 500 response. You, know, you see the uh, sorry a problem occurred web page. Latency, however, is more difficult to get right at scale. And when I say get it right, there are two aspects of being right. First, does your measurement have the right precision for your scale? That is, if I have 1 million user requests, can you generate a latency aggregate, which means you aren't leaving more than a few dozen users off? You know, precision here is the number of decimal places. The other aspect is accuracy. Is your latency aggregate for an SLO or a monitor actually correct? In many cases, I've seen that answer is no to both. And, you know, precision versus accuracy. Precision is the number of decimal places. Accuracy is are the values in those decimal places correct? So let's dive in. So coming back to this chart, um, this chart is a um, RRD graph and it measures network usage and calculates the 95th percentile over a time period. And at the time of the dot-com boom, uh, you saw a lot of these RRD graphs um, and these were mostly used for um, metering bandwidth. Bandwidth was built on something like five megabits at 95th percentile, meaning that if you took all your five minute uh, bandwidth usage measurement slices and ordered them, and took the 95th percentile, if that number was above, above five megabits, you in, incur overage charges. And this first popularized the approach of using percentiles, and that would you know, really notably be seen about 10 years later in 2011 with the advent of the StatsD protocol developed by Etsy, which provided the P95 as a latency aggregation metric. And I wrote more about this in a blog post I published last year, and I'll go into some of the content in the next slides. But this is, you know, this is the historical significance of this graph. So let's talk about percentiles. This is a slide from a SLO presentation I gave at SRECon 2019. It illustrates two latency distribution profiles, which are meant to represent service nodes that are behaving differently. The blue distribution represents a bimodal, bimodal latency profile with lower latencies than the single mode red latency distribution. Basically, this could be two web servers, one performing well and one performing not as well. The red server is not performing as well. And if we take the um, P95 values for latency for each server and we average those, we could get you know, an indicator of around 430 milliseconds. And we might think that, hey, that's the performance of our service. But if we combine the raw latency values from each of these distribution sets and calculate the aggregate P95 from those, we'll get 230 milliseconds. And the error there is almost 100%. And many, if not all of the monitoring and observability tools out there will happily let you use an averaging function for percentiles generated from different hosts, nodes, or clusters. If your distribution profiles are the same, no problem, that works great. But it's when your services are behaving asymmetrically that you'll encounter large errors with this approach. And this is a problem with percentiles. And I talked about that uh, in depth in that presentation. So, you know, beware of using percentiles. I've, I've talked about this and, and ranted about this. And this kind of illustrates, you know, uh, you know, the prime condition where that's a, an issue. And again, if everything's running smoothly or if you have a single node, percentiles work just great. But it's the real world scenarios where, you know, we have, have different nodes, uh, performance profiles, and you know, possibly hundreds or thousands of, of nodes serving requests that we want to be able to handle and evaluate um, evaluate how our service is performing accurately. So that leads into you know histograms for measuring uh, web service latency. And uh, I I give an internal talk I call Doctor Histogram: How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Latency Bands at, at Zendesk a few years ago. Um, and I, I went into more depth on the intricacies of these three different types of histograms in the SLO conf link below. But in short, you know, there's essentially three, well, there's a couple of different approaches you can use for measuring latency with histogram. And this involves essentially collecting a latency sample and fitting it into what we call a bucket or a bin. And you'll see the, the gray and, 
uh, blue bars here, those are your buckets or bins. And so let's take a look at how these are implemented differently. First, we could have uh, a log linear histogram, which um, you, know, you can see the details of at openhistogram.io. And if we have you know, a latency value here of 125 milliseconds, we could say like, oh, you know, we'll just slot that sample into you know, the greater than 100 millisecond but less than 200 millisecond bucket. And so that, this is a data structure that is fairly easy to represent because all you have is you know, an array representing uh, different histogram buckets and then you increase the value of that array, essentially a counter for each of those. And this is a volume invariant way of storing large amounts of latency data um, that you can also use to generate highly accurate um, aggregates for you know, an entire cluster or any, any set of, of hosts. And folks might also be familiar with the NIDL structure. That's the cumulative histogram, um, which uh, Prometheus uses. So if I have a latency value of 125 milliseconds, it will assign labels starting at less than infinity all the way down to you know less than 200. So this takes uh, a few more data structures to, or a few more counter values to implement, and it's not quite as efficient as the log linear histogram. And at Zendesk, I, I flipped that on its head and came up what was called an inverse cumulative uh, histogram, where, for an example, if we have 125 milliseconds, I could have a counter data structure. Um, bump the counter and assign these labels to it, and you know, which are often known as metric tags. You know, I could assign greater than 10, greater than 50, greater than 100 milliseconds, but not greater than 200 milliseconds. And this actually, this approach made my head hurt for a little bit, but it has some advantages in terms of operator efficiency and ease of use of implementing with a lot of the tooling out there. Um, and you know, all these all these buckets that can also be referred to as latency bands. So you can kind of take a look at you know each of these different types of histograms and decide you know I might want to try to use histograms for storing latency so you know one of these should give you some good good results and you might ask well okay well now I know how to to capture latency in a histogram at scale how do I generate an SLO from it well let's go back to our definition it's the number of good requests divided by the number of bad requests over a time range and so in this case. You know, we can use a histogram data for the SLI. We can sum up the number of requests below 100 milliseconds, and we can divide that by the total number of requests, which would just be the, the count sum of all the bins, and we can multiply that by 100. You know, in the case of you know, the number of requests under 100 milliseconds, with the inverse cumulative histogram, we just add up the number, of, we add up the counts of the blue bars, um, with um, the uh, log linear histogram, we just add up all those the counts of the three bars to the left of the three gray bars to the left of the blue bar. So mathematically, this is very simple to implement, and it's it's fast. It works quickly with all monitoring solutions out there, and it's also extremely accurate because you're adding up, you know, counts of essentially raw data, and it it also gives you essentially arbitrary precision. So this is a very robust and accurate approach. And I, I highly recommend this because this will give you some, some great numbers at scale. Um, now, and, and you might say like, well, this is a lot of work to do, but again, it goes back to prioritizing reliability work. So we wanna make sure that our data about if we're hitting our SLOs is accurate because we're spending likely spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on, on shifting this engineering work. Now, um, how, you know, I showed the, some raw histograms there um, where we keep count of a number of samples in each bin and that way we can, we can sum them up. But there's some uh, approximate structures out there which you can use you know, and some of the vendors provide to do the same things. You know, and they're called, often called sketches like um, the GK sketch or the DD sketch structure um, by one of the vendors. And there's also approximate histograms such as T-Digest made by Ted Dunning, which stores approximations of distributions. And this, these two charts here were taken from the uh, log linear uh, circle hist paper for open histogram. And they represent error percentages for two different types of workloads across different you know, P9X values on the x-axis. And you can see the red line here, which is the open histogram implementation. That's got very low errors. But then you look at like the T-Digest, uh, DD-Sketch, and HDR histogram. 
um, which do relatively well in terms of errors. However, there is a detail that is not in these charts. These errors are for single node evaluations only, say for one web server. Now, how do approximate histograms and sketches behave across asymmetric node workloads um, of, of you know, hundreds of web servers or arbitrary time windows? And that's a very difficult question to answer, but by and large, the errors are likely to be unbounded. And using histograms which store the exact sample counts, as I termed raw histograms on the previous slide, um, those avoid that problem entirely, ensuring that any aggregates generated for them, you know, for SLOs are, are highly accurate and precise. So the sketches, you know, are, are, are good to a certain extent, but they, they don't really hit the same level of precision as these raw histograms. Now, um, while we're on the subject of histograms, I want to highlight some recent work in this area by Adrian Cockroft. Um, Adrian published a Medium post titled Percentiles Don't Work. Um, I think he coined them as wrong but useful, um, analyzing the distribution of response times for web services. Um, a few months ago, um, you know, he started doing some work here where he looked at operational telemetry, which is usually latency, and using some R-based tooling to decompose it into component normal-ish distributions. So this image here was taken from his blog post where he was able to take you know, a, a bimodal histogram here and decompose it into two normal distributions using the mixed tools R package. Now, why is, that, why is this important? And what does this have to do with SLOs? We just took a look at um, what magnitude of errors can arise from using percentiles for latency measurements. So we follow that up with looking at histograms to measure latency distributions. Um, so with something like this, um, we can, you know, assign, we can pull out these normal distributions. Um, and this could be relevant if we wanted to make an SLO for something like disk writes, where you might have, you know, writing to a block, block device or versus just, you know, writing to cache or, or reading from the block device as opposed to reading the cache. We can use these to implement fine grained SLOs for each of the different um, modes of kind of the physical um, uh, manifestations of the system. You know, in, in the cloud, it could be like writing to S3 or, or, you know, different storage levels there. And so there's some really promising work here. Um, and uh, I think that this, you know, this is definitely something to follow going ahead because, you know, if you really want to get fine grained with, you know, say a system that has a few different modes at very large scale, this approach um, would allow you to do that. Now, um, one common question I've gotten about SLOs and error budgets is how do you implement them across a distributed service architecture? Now, one approach is to use an SLO and error budget for each service, and this includes third-party uh, vendor services as, as shown in blue here. Now, the error rates I've shown here um, and documented in red um, are error rates across these different services. So you can have you know, a different error rate contribution from the third-party service, the mid-tier, and the edge tier. And um, you can take those and you can add those up and essentially get a compound or composite error rate for what the customer is seeing. So in this case, you might see that, hey, um, our in-house backend service has a 0.1% error rate. Um, but then if you roll that up to the mid-tier, you know, now you've got, uh, you know, um, 1% error rate also from the third party, which exceeds your mid-tier error budget of 1%. And so, the, you know, you can kind of put these these diagrams together and it will help you understand, you know, where you need to focus reliability work. Um, in this case, you know, you need to focus reliability work on the third party and either, you know, pull that in house or, or do some sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, interface around it to make it more reliable. And the goal here is not to assign blames to teams or to different services. It's to prioritize reliability work. Um, and that's that's really what this is all about. Um, because, you know, for most of almost, I would say almost all of you out there, you're using some sort of distributed system like this. And you're going to say like, well, you know, how, how do we use SLOs across that? Remember to be customer centric and you can uh, roll those error budgets up, you know, starting from, you know, uh, I'll call it uh, upstream, which is further away from the client. You can roll those error rates up um, and, and get a composite error rate, you know, fairly simply and see what the client is seeing. And that's it. My tour through uh, 
um, techniques for SLOs and air budgets at scale. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or um, Twitter, and that Twitter handle also works across uh, Mastodon and a couple of the other news sites popping up. I'd love to hear about your experiences and um, you know talk about how you're using SLOs and air budgets at scale. Thanks, Conf42. I'll see you next time.